Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the SCI's Breakthroughs in Cancer seminar series. This is our monthly seminar series to bring luminaries in the cancer field to campus. Um, we have a, a robust lineup this year. Dr. Wakeley's here, Hi, Heather. Um, for the rest of the year, this is what the lineup looks like. It's David Hong, Jen, Jenny Wargo, Charles Sawyers, Ursula Matrilonis, and Jennifer Grandis. Uh, the next speaker will be David Hong, and he's the Deputy Chief of um, Developmental Therapeutics at MD Anderson, and he'll speak on targeting RAS. Uh, that will be uh, in person here next month. Um, and I'm just going to get started to pre-introduce our speaker today, who's Dr. Susan Domjek. And Susan and I have known each other for 28 years. We just were reminiscing for the past hour. We were residents together at Massachusetts General Hospital, interns and residents. And it's um, it was an incredible period in my training where I probably the most the, the highest velocity of learning, I think, at any point in my training and uh, just incredible camaraderie as well. And the great thing about training in a place like MGH or Stanford or Penn is that you have colleagues who are so smart around you that you can learn from. And Susan was one of those uh, colleagues when we were interns and residents together. We were on the same firm. The residency program was divided into groups called firms. And we would have attending rounds after being up all night and admitting patients. And I remember the, the mad rush we would have in trying to prepare the patient presentation for the attending and what an amazing job Susan did with her presentations and how much I learned her from her. And then we were also in the same primary care uh, setting. Um, and that was also an, an incredible experience to be uh, side by side with Susan. And we're going to hear more about the exciting things that Susan has done. But for that introduction, we're going to bring up Dr. Kurian. Welcome, Susan. So it's certainly my privilege to introduce Dr. Domchek, and I just have to follow that by saying that Dr. Domchek was my chief resident in Mass General. So we have a bit of Mass General up here today, but lots of admiration and many years of that. So thank you so much. Dr. Domchek is the Basser Professor in Oncology at the Perelman School of Medicine of the University of Pennsylvania. She also serves as Executive Director of the Basser Center for BRCA at the Abramson Cancer Center, and also as Director of the Marianne and Robert McDonald Cancer Risk Evaluation Program. Her work focuses on the genetic evaluation and medical management of individuals with inherited risk factors for cancer. And she's particularly interested in developing new cancer therapeutics, such as PARP inhibitors, for breast cancer due to genetic factors. Dr. Domchak is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, the American Society for Clinical Investigation, and the Association of American Physicians, among many other honors. She is a significant contributor to the oncology literature with more than 400 articles in prestigious journals such as New England Journal of Medicine, and she also serves on a number of editorial review boards. So glad to have you with us. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's, it's such a pleasure to be here. And uh, yes, I haven't thought much about Mass General, but it's been fun to reminisce a little bit. Uh, it was a long time ago, and I feel a little old, but that's that's all right. Today, I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit about um, how we have used BRCA1 and BRCA2 over the years to really understand how to best treat patients, um, but also how to move forward and think about uh, cancer interception, which has a specific uh, definition that I'll review. Uh, here, I just briefly, I've had some modest honoraria uh, from AstraZeneca and GSK, although more than five years ago. And the two main areas that I want to review are this concept of homologous recombination repair and therapeutics, um, specifically focusing on sort of both the germline and also somatic testing and which genes might be relevant. And then I want to take you into a little bit of, you know, how to go into this concept of cancer interception and basically what's the you know, next great step in on oncology. So I think as many of you in the room know, uh, PARP inhibitors, um, oral drugs, um, are effective in BRCA1 and 2 associated cancers. And specifically in uh, breast cancer, we have uh, alaparib and talazoparib. Uh, for uh, prostate cancer, alaparib, recaparib. Uh, for pancreatic cancer, alaparib, and also a recaparib for the MCCN. And then ovarian cancer, alaparib, recaparib, and neraparib. And particularly for ovarian cancer, 
the indications extend beyond the BRCA1 and 2 population. But this is just to give you an example of sort of how we got started and where we are. And you, you will note that these tumor types are all what, you know, I kind of consider canonical tumors. So these are the cancers in which mutations in these genes are associated with these cancer types. Um, we're going to talk a little bit later, but there can be mutations in BRCA1 and 2 in cancers that are not specifically these canonical tumor types. And sort of what does that mean? And can we target them therapeutically um, will be part of my, my talk as well. But just for background, um, these are uh, two examples of studies that we've done. Um, on your left is the Olympiad trial. This looked at a laparib compared to chemotherapy for germline BRCA1 and 2 associated metastatic breast cancer, demonstrating an improvement in progressive free survival. There was also a doubling of the response rate, and this led to an FDA approval for laparib in this indication was followed by work by Jennifer Litton and others looking at Talazobra with almost an identical curve. And on the right is a study uh, done um, uh, with my colleague Kim uh, Rice at Penn looking at Recapper for BRCA1 and 2 and PALB2 associated pancreatic cancer. Everything below uh, the line is a response. Below the dotted line is sort of a, a documented, if you will, response uh, demonstrating uh, activity. And so these were very exciting studies, um, very, very impressive data, also in ovarian and, and prostate cancer, which I'm not showing you here. But the next question was, can you take it earlier? So even though there is this improvement in progression of free survival, you can see that we're not curing most people. Although I do have some exceptional responders, including someone who's been on elaborate for 14 years now, but they're rare. Um, and so what we need to do is try to take it into the earlier setting and see what we can do. So here's uh, the trial design for the Olympia study. Uh, this is a study um, that um, I was fortunate enough to be a part of, and I'm leading the translational advisory committee uh, for this study. So hopefully you'll hear more over the years to come about uh, some more details uh, about the science that we learn. But these were individuals who had early stage but high risk breast cancer in the setting of a known germline mutation. And they could either have received neoadjuvant chemotherapy um, and have residual disease left if triple negative, or if you will, a lot of disease if you are positive. Or in individuals who had their surgery first, they either needed to have node positive or greater than two centimeter triple negative cancer. And for hormone receptor positive cancers, they had to have four positive lymph nodes. This was a requirement from the FDA not to get into it too much. And the ER positive cohort was added later. And you'll see that's a little bit of why there weren't that many ER positive patients on this study. Nonetheless, they got all their surgery, all their chemotherapy, radiation is indicated, and then were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to a lap group for a year versus placebo. And more than 1,800 people were enrolled throughout the world. And by the way, this is hard to do. Um, it was many countries, um, and it was a partnership between cooperative groups in the US and Europe and also AstraZeneca. Uh, the primary endpoint was invasive disease-free survival, although it was also powered to look at overall survival as a secondary endpoint. So the baseline characteristics, 71% uh, of uh, patients had a BRCA1 mutation. The median age was 42, which just gives you a reminder of who it is that we're treating um, in this setting, very young patients. Um, about half had gotten adjuvant, half neoadjuvant chemotherapy. About a quarter received platinum as part of their regimen. It wasn't a requirement, but about a quarter did. Um, and again, 80% had triple negative breast cancer. And these are the primary uh, results that were published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2021. And you can see that there's a significant improvement in both invasive uh, disease-free survival, distant disease-free survival. So that's uh, decreasing the chances of metastatic disease. And at the time of this initial analysis, the overall survival endpoint was not met. Uh, but again, it was an early look at the data. This actually was stopped by the DSMB on sort of an earlier look, even though all the patients had been enrolled and completed therapy. So the trial wasn't stopped early, uh, but the initial readout was a little earlier than expected. Uh, subsequently, um, we uh, published in the Annals of Oncology in December 2022, uh, uh, the updated invasive disease survival curve 
which at three years, there is an absolute difference of about 9%, which in breast cancer is a very large number. Uh, so for some, some diseases that might not be seen as large, but here that's, that's a big number. Um, and it maintains at four years, uh, here's 7%. And now when you look at the overall survival and we had what's called plenty of alpha to look at this, meaning it was statistically valid to be looking at the overall survival, you can see that at three years, there's a overall survival difference of 4% and 3.8 and at four years of 3.4. And again, at this uh, quick look, this is at three years, already seeing an overall survival benefit is a big deal in breast cancer. This is a standard of care now for individuals with BRCA1 and 2 mutations. And actually, really, the question is, how low should we go? That's more of our problem now, is that it's easy if you have residual disease following new adjuvant chemotherapy, but what do you do with somebody with like two positive lymph nodes? You know, that is ER positive, and I'll be honest, I treat those, but, uh, but there is a discussion uh, about how much outside the indication by the FDA you should go. On the subgroup analysis, everything to the left means that it's helpful. Um, there are a few that have wide confidence intervals, but that's just because the numbers are small, uh, prior platinum and ER positive, but they're all to the left of the curve. So statistically speaking, there's no, you know, differences seen. ER positive disease does have sort of a different, you know, uh, uh, pace, but at the same time, these are cancers that really, we really do feel are biologically driven by BRCA1 and 2, um, which, which may have a difference altogether. And interestingly enough, and uh, something I'll get into later in the talk is, you know, is there any kind of signal that there might be secondary prevention from a lap rib, so prevention of new cancers? And in the early study, uh, again, published a few years ago, you see that there were 32 uh, new cancers in the placebo group and 19 in the lap rib group. Too early to, to make any kind of statistical comment on, but numerically different. Please note that when you look at MDS or AML, which everyone is con rightly concerned about that a lap rib might induce those, there were no differences uh, between the two. In fact, there's one AML in each arm. Um, so we're not seeing an excess of uh, hematologic malignancies. And when uh, this data was updated, and this, this hasn't been published, but it was presented in an ESMO plenary session, interestingly enough, if you look at ovarian cancer and uh, fallopian tube cancers, there's two in the elaborate group and there's 10 in the placebo group. So, you know, again, early days, but there does seem to be a potential signal. Um, so I think that this is, a, again, something I'll talk about more later, but like, can there be a role for PARP inhibitors? So for germline, uh, so for germline, BRCA1 and 2 and canonical tumors, we have good data that we should, uh, that these are good drugs. So what about somatic mutations? So this is a study we published in 2018, looking at uh, recaparib, a PARP inhibitor in metastatic pancreatic cancer with both germline and somatic mutations. And I, for those medical oncology uh, fellows that might be in the room that get discouraged uh, by clinical trial design, this trial was supposed to be larger, but the company ended it early because we didn't see three responses, but that's because all the three responses were the last three patients. So it was very unfortunate, um, and, uh, but we definitely saw um, efficacy. And interestingly, two of the three responders had somatic mutations. And also interestingly, people often ask about variant allele frequency. The variant allele frequencies in those somatic onlys were 14%, 14%, and 36%. But remember, there's a lot of uh, normal stromal infiltration of normal cells in pancreatic cancer. So you just have to be careful about this. And this is an interesting and ongoing question, particularly now that we're using circulating tumor DNA, like how low is too low? Is there ever a, a degree to which you say there's just not enough, uh, 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 if you will, BRSA there? But nonetheless, we, we see an effect with somatic BRSA here. And this was also seen in Kim's follow-up study, which included somatic uh, BRSA 1 and 2 so that was uh, pancreatic cancer. We also worked with Nadine Tung um, in, with this publication in JCO in 2020. And this included individuals uh, with somatic mutations in a variety of genes. And what you can see in the blue is somatic BRCA1 and 2. And again, below the line are responses. And you can basically see that all the BRCA1 and 2s, you know, most the response rate was very high in somatic BRCA1 and 2. Numbers are still small, but very, very consistent across multiple studies. So that does raise this question of, okay, well, this is great. Like BRCA1 and 2, whether it's germline or whether it's somatic, we see responses. So could we start to think about a tumor agnostic approach? 
there have been tumor agnostic uh, uh, approvals by the FDA, including pembrolizumab for mismatch repair, and also looking at the uh, NTRAC gene fusions. So I think there was a lot of interest in whether or not this could be applied uh, to BRCA1 and 2 tumors of any, of any type. And so just as a little bit of a background for this, so we've already established that the presence of germline or somatic pathogenic variants in these, you know, again, canonical tumors are strongly uh, predictive of response to PARP inhibitor tumors. And again, I'm defining canonical here as breast, ovarian, prostate, and pancreatic cancer. Uh, and, you know, we can get back to this minimal variant allele frequency or whether or not we, there's a requirement for LOH. But in all these studies, the response rates are like 60%. So even if you don't look at that, you still get these very high responses. But when you start to look at BRCA1 and 2 besides these classical tumors, there's been multiple studies, and I just put three here uh, for, for your consideration, which looked at um, tumors either in the TCGA or in other data sets, including Memorial Sloan Kettering's impact series. And when you look at tumors beyond breast and ovarian cancer, and you look at whether or not there was loss of the second allele, um, so whether there was allele-specific LOH, um, I think I'll mess this up if I try to do this, but in the, in the big, uh, in the, if you see where there's that big blue columns there, that's that there is no uh, loss of the second allele. And those were the non-BRSA1 and 2 tumors. And if you go figure to figure, what you end up saying is that if you look at the non-canonical tumors that have BRSA1 and 2 mutations, 10 to 15% of the time, there's loss of the second copy, okay? So most of the time there's not. Sometimes there is, by the way. And if you say about 50% of the time that the tumors will respond, maybe you'll get a 5% response rate. So there have been studies that are looking at this. And so the one I'll present here is a study we were involved in, and as was uh, Dr. Telly, uh, and this was called Javelin BRCA ATM. And the objective in this particular study was to look at the com a combination of Evalumab and Telazoprib to see whether it was effective in pathogenic BRCA1 and 2 or ATM alterations. A the BRCA1 or 2 could be germline or somatic, and this was regardless of tumor type. And sort of the key is over here on the right. Um, you can see that if you had the not dependent tumor, there were 37 tumors, there were three responses. That's it, it was 8%. All three, it turned out, were uterine leiomyosarcomas, which was very interesting. And these had somatic large genomic rearrangement, uh, uh, somatic BRCA2 large genomic rearrangement. So that's a very interesting finding for sure. But the other ones, it was a bit of a, you know, a bit of a letdown. We really didn't see much of note. Um, two of 41 patients in the ATM cohort responded. And I'll show you more data about that. Papor and Lodestar are still out there, but I can tell you that it's kind of similar. So basically, if it's unless we have a better selection, you can't just use the presence of a germline or somatic mutation. You're going to have to have another selection criteria before you treat, if you will, these other cancer types. Okay, so what about other genes? So this is a study that Dr. Curry and I were lucky to be involved in um, called the Carrier Study, which looked at 60, you know, over 60,000 patients, you know, 30,000 cases of breast cancer, 30,000 controls, and looked at which genes were associated uh, with uh, breast cancer. And what you find is that the prevalence of pathogenic variants in unselected um, uh, breast cancer cases is about 2.6% with BRCA1, BRCA2, and PALB2. But then if you look at ATM and CHECK2, it's another almost 2%. So ATM and CHECK2 are really common. And so I think there's been a lot of interest in, well, these are all in the you know, homologous recombination repair pathway. Uh, will they, will PARP inhibitors work for these can cancer types too, uh, for these genes too? So first let's start with PALB2. So this is also the elaborate expanded uh, trial led by Nadine Tung. Um, and here we did enroll individuals with germline uh, PALB2 mutations as well as CHECK2 and ATM. PALB2 is in teal and they're all over there. Again, below the line, it's really nice when it works out so well visually, which is not that common. Um, so there were a lot of responses seen um, in PALB2. And here is CHECK2 and ATM and they are all above the line. So we really just don't see a signal for CHECK2 and ATM. And, Again, with the Javelin study, we saw a similar finding, like PARP inhibitors don't appear to work very well, but in breast cancer, we can get into a discussion 
at the end about prostate cancer and, and, and the trial designs there. But um, for uh, breast cancer, you know, patients should not be given PARP inhibitors for germline ATM or TAC2 mutations. Um, by the way, uh, uh, this is not our work, uh, and it was a small study, but very similar finding. Here, the color coding is actually the, uh, the, the cancer type, so it's a little confusing, but just I can assure you that below the line is the PALB2s, um, and above the line are not PALB2s. So PALB2, again, has kind of been persistently shown uh, to uh, mutations in PALB2 to be responsive to PARP inhibitors. All right, so again, PARP inhibitors seem to have a limited activity in ATM and check to associate breast cancers. Other uh, agents may play a role. I was really excited about ATR inhibitors uh, because I had a patient who's done exceptionally well in a study, but it's not clear where that is going to go. Um, so we will see. And I think that there's, and I, I talked to a, a bunch of people about this today, about what is the role of other mechanisms, uh, other ways of identifying homologous recombination repair deficiency, sort of not just germline or somatic, but can you do these HRD scores? We know that in ovarian cancer, it does seem to identify a population of patients who respond to PARP inhibitors. But I would also say that these are all individuals who got platinum and their disease responded to platinum, which in itself may just identify a group of tumors that might be responsive to PARP inhibitors. There is evolving data in breast cancer, things like HR detect and other things, but it is hard because in breast cancer, you know, we have an opportunity to treat patients and then their disease recurs. And their disease, when it recurs, may be biologically acting really differently, even if it still has that same scar, even if it has that same pattern, it may functionally not really be a responsive anymore. So a real-time HRD status would be particularly interesting. And there's a lot of interest in RAD51 foci and um, Violette Serra and Judith Balmania at that Val de Baron have, have been developing this assay. We It's a hard assay. We haven't really gotten it to work very well in our hands. Um, uh, but I think that something like that would be incredibly valuable if we could tell in real time. Um, but instead, these HRD assays, which might work really well in ovarian cancer because we're testing them before the tumor is given anything, it may be very different when we're looking at it later when the, the tumor has already seen drugs. And again, there's all sorts of interest in, in combination approaches, ATR plus PARP inhibitor, BET plus PARP inhibitor. You know, we published, you know, Dravalumab um, plus um, uh, Alaparib and BRSA carriers where, you know, again, it was a small study, but we didn't see any dramatic increase in response rate. So who knows which ones will play a role here it's, it's not only in known carriers to try to prevent the development of resistance, but it's also to expand the repertoire, right? So if you could use a combination, you could enhance sort of this HRD uh, phenotype and cause this BRCA nest. So I think there's a lot of work to do. And this is sort of getting at this issue of, you know, the, the potential to use platinum as uh, a platinum sensitivity as a biomarker in a, in a lot of ways is what they do in ovarian cancer, because even those patients, the tumor do, that doesn't have like this HRD, they're still there's still some signal there, right? And that may just be that because they responded to platinum already and our HRD assay is not perfect. So here, my colleague, a colleague Kim Rice, who's our a uh, pancreatic BRCA sort of person um, designed this study where uh, we gave platinum chemotherapy for at least four months, um, no development of platinum resistant. They And then they went on to maintenance with a PARP inhibitor, this in this case, niraparib, and, and immune therapy, either IPI, um, so CTLA-4, or NEVO, again, uh, uh, pd one and then looking at progression-free survival. And first of all, what you can see is that some patients actually did well. And these, by the way, some were mutation carriers, but most were not. So this is a chemotherapy-free maintenance strategy that like some people are responding to, which was a little surprise. But the other surprise is that the group that got IPI did much better than the group that got NEVO. And I can't necessarily explain that right now, but people are, were working on it. Um, and if you took out the, the um, mutation carriers, still the median uh, progression for survival was 7.6 months in the near IPI group, which is like, again, for pancreatic cancer without a known mutation, getting a chemotherapy free drug. That's pretty cool. So again, we're a lot of work to be done, still a small trial, et cetera, et cetera. But interesting that platinum sensitivity itself could be a, you know, a biomarker. 
All right. So germline somatic pathogenic variants. And by the way, we just make it confusing. We used to say mutations. Now we say pathogenic variants. Uh, it's 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 not all coming from us, but the, the official term, even though I don't always use it, is pathogenic variant at this point. Um, and BRCA1, BRCA2, and PALB2 are uh, strong predictors of response and you know, classic, if you will, BRCA tumors. And tumors outside the typical phenotype with these pathogenic variants, you shouldn't assume uh, uh, pathogenicity. The Javelin BRCA ATM data are not encouraging. And again, whether or not we can look for a little specific LOH or HRD or RAD51 foci, I think we have to figure that out. Um, check to an ATM mutation breast cancers are not sensitive to PARP inhibitors. And so I, we do sometimes see off-label use and it is strongly discouraged. And again, to expand the use of PARP inhibitors, we need to use either evolving assays to better select, or we need to use combination therapies um, to induce that BRSA ness. So now I'm going to sort of swerve and sort of go into the area, which I think, you know, I'm really excited and interesting about. And in a lot of the conversations that I have with people today, and give me take home thought, um, which is this area, you know, of cancer interception. So this term was coined by Liz Blackburn, uh, which is an active way of combating cancer and carcinogenesis in earlier and earlier stages. So it's different from prevention, if you will, where you don't smoke. And so lack of smoking, you don't induce those changes. But here it's starting, you know, that the cancer is starting to form and you're going to try to intervene biologically. And there's some paradigm, if you will, mechanical interception of, you know, adenoma removal could be, you know, an example of a mechanical interception. Um, but when you start to think about disease interception like this, you really need to have a good idea of individualized risk. So colonic adenomas are individualized risk, hairy leukoplakia. You know, there's some examples there, but in my world, you know, germline risk. Well, we know about a bunch of cancer uh, predisposition genes, and we have a very good sense for some of these of exactly what our risks are. Uh, so for BRCA1 and 2, and again, I know this group knows this well, but, you know, breast, you know, ovarian, pancreas, prostate, and we have really good numbers. So for instance, in women with breast cancer, like between ages like 45 and 65, you know, you can say that the risk is like two, two to 3% a year, you know, which means that you could potentially design trials around those numbers. Um, so we have risk reducing surgery for BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers. We know that removal of the breast, removal of the ovaries, it decreases risk, but it comes at a high cost. And therefore there's a lot of you know, uh, discussion um, about uh, timing of those interventions. We know that risk reducing ovophorectomy is associated with the reduction in mortality. Although as a side note with PARP inhibitors these days and first line maintenance, it's gonna be interesting to re... Allison, you got to rerun that decision analysis because I don't, I don't know that it's true anymore, right? Um, but not that you want to get ovarian cancer, but just uh, so when you think about cancer interception, the BRCA one and two space, you know, on the left you start every cell in the body has one good copy, one bad copy. Most of the time, you know, the second copy is lost. You develop these abnormal cells, early stage disease, metastatic disease, right? And that's our, you know, general idea of how this occurs. And when you think about standard drug development, we start at metastatic disease and we work our way into early uh, disease. And that may not be biologically, may, that may, may not make any sense at all biologically, depending on what we're trying to do, right? So what we'd love to do is work on it the other way and have this sort of biologically informed disease interception where we're really targeting, you know, that key area there, like this lot, you know, going in again, many of you heard me obsessed today about haploinsufficiency. I'm like just completely obsessed by the haploinsufficient state and whether, you know, what it means and how we can intervene on this, like going from uh, from that state to loss of the second copy, right? So, you know, I we take, you know, all, 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 all areas of interest, but, you know, the, the idea here, and again, sorry for the kind of maybe simplistic graphic, but it's very rare to develop a, a cancer prior to age 25. So that idea is that you're sort of starting to uh, accumulate abnormal cells, but what if you could like periodically like weed the garden and like take out all those cells, right? Before they develop a clinically apparent cancer. And then you could just periodically do it like every 15 years, right? That would be kind of cool that you would prevent cancer from developing in the first place. Yes, I know it's idealistic, but you got to start somewhere. So, well, are there any strategies? Well, very conceptually, you can think about it as on um, as cancer specific. 
Like we know in the general population that birth control pills decrease ovarian cancer risk, things like CIRMs um, and aromatase inhibitors decrease breast cancer risk. Again, we don't, we don't have a ton of data about sort of prostate and pancreatic cancer, but you could, you could think about something like that. If you go pathway oriented, and I'll, and I'll talk about in more detail, you know, PARP inhibitors and rank ligands as a potential option, but, you know, could you use mRNA somehow? Could you figure out protein folding or anti -sense? Like just to think about it completely differently. Like if you could get from 50% expression of BRCA1 to 80% expression, would that take care of the problem? Not saying that that's easy to do, but you guys are smart. You can figure something out. Um, you know, how about the immune system? Everybody is increasingly understanding that the immune system is important. So how could we use that? And then of course, in parallel, you have to develop better early detection strategies because if someone's gonna keep their ovaries in place, you have to be able to tell them that you're gonna be able to find the ovarian cancer before it's a problem, right? So, um, you know, in that way, everything from circulating DNA to artificial intelligence needs to play a role. So I'm gonna take you through like three potential interception strategies, right? And uh, two, of, two of which we have clinical trials on. So the first is rank ligand. So this is based on work by uh, uh, Jeffrey Lindemann in Australia and Christian Singer in Austria, who published uh, studies very similar, very uh, soon next to each other um, about this issue, which is that a rank ligand is important in the development of triple negative breast cancer in BRCA one mutation carriers. And it turns out that we have a very well-known commercially available rank ligand inhibitor called denosumab, which is used for osteoporosis. And we actually widely use it in, in oncology for prevention of um, complications of skeletal metastases. So it's a drug we all know very well. And uh, so the BRCAP trial, which is this very large international study, is a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled uh, trial looking at denosumab versus placebo in women with BRCA1 uh, mutations. But just to give you a sense of how big this study is and how hard this is to do, this will involve 2,900 women. Um, you have to also factor in the number of patients who will drop off because they'll decide to have their mastectomy, um, which of course, you know, we're not gonna prevent them from doing. Um, these individuals will be randomized one to one to denosumab, uh, denosumab subcutaneously every six months versus a placebo subcutaneous injection every six months for five years. And the total study duration will be 10 years and the outcome is breast cancer occurrence. So we are enrolling in this study. We just got it open. I don't know about you, Allison, but um, we're, we just en enrolled our first patient. She hasn't been treated yet. Um, It'll be interesting to see whether we can complete enrollment to this trial. Uh, the enrollment, again, the U.S. is really just getting up and going, but the enrollment's been a little sluggish, and it's a lot of patients. Um, but uh, this is the only way we'll get the answer uh, to the to the question. Okay, so that's one potential option. The second issue is, you know, I showed you these, you know, kind of intriguing data about a lap rib and this idea that, you know, could you in some weird world, use la uh, a PARP inhibitor. Now we all recognize that PARP inhibitors are not without toxicity. On the other hand, I don't know, they're not that, like people take them, they take them for a year, they have some nausea, they have some fatigue, um, but they're taking them for a reason. And so it's very different to take a drug for that versus prevention. Like we know that tamoxifen and raloxifen decrease breast cancer risk by 50% and nobody takes them. Um, and so you know, the idea that we have drugs, you know, people will say, why don't you have a drug to prevent breast cancer? We're like, we do, <laughs> but nobody will take it. So it has to be feasible. It has to be acceptable. And also there's no way you're going to give a PARP inhibitor uh, for five years. Um, so what do we know about the quality of life? Well, these are data that, you know, Patty Gans did very extensive quality of life data for our Olympia trial. And overall, the quality of life, really there were no differences on overall health-related quality of life. There, uh, she, she's about to submit or publish, submit, I think, uh, the more detailed quality of life data. And yes, you see a little bit more nausea and a little bit more fatigue, but actually the fatigue, it doesn't uh, meet the definition of being clinically significant. Now, having said that, we dose adjust, we, you have to manage it. Like, it's not like if you do it and walk away that people are fine, you have to manage the toxicity. Nonetheless, like it seems tolerable, but what we of course need is longer follow-up regarding toxicity, particularly MDS and AML. 
um, we need to look at those secondary cancers and continue to see that there's this decrease. But we also need appropriate modeling work on the potential schedules because you know the idea would be like a pulsatile administration. Like what if you could give a month a year or could you go to two weeks? Like how many cell cycles do you have to get through? And are you going to lead to primarily PARP inhibitor resistant tumors if they grow out? That would be bad. Um, so there's gotta be a lot of um, you know, modeling work to, to be done. And at the same time, you know, haven't quite gotten all the way there yet, but this is on my list of things to do, is that um, to do window of opportunity studies to test the feasibility and whether these strategies would be acceptable to healthy individuals. So you can just give, you know, a mutation carrier who's about to have a mastectomy, a month of a PARP inhibitor, do biopsies before, you know, get the tissue after, you're going to now ask me what biomarkers I'm looking for. And I'm going to tell you, I don't really know. Uh, but if we get the tissue correctly done, then while we're doing these feasibility studies, we can obtain those tissues. And then our basic science colleagues are going to help us figure out exactly, you know, exactly what to test. So I think that, um, you know, I, again, I don't, I'm not saying this is the right answer either. I'm just saying that this is a feasible potential strategy, right? Because that's how tamoxifen works. Metastatic, adjuvant, prevention, right? I mean, so that's the next step potentially. And then, then there's cancer immunointerception. So again, post COVID, I don't have to tell anybody that like immune prevention of an infection was, is, you know, the great immune uh, revolution, but it works for prevention. It doesn't work for treatment. We, we know that, right? That post-exposure vaccination generally doesn't work. And, you know, these cancer vaccines, as people talked about them, had a poor track record, but we were giving people vaccines in the metastatic setting, and then we were surprised when people's cancers didn't go away. And that's really not what they're, they're used for. And, but even then, we found out they were safe. We found out that they were immunogenic, um, but they just didn't, you know, lead to pr uh, pronounced response rates. And by the way, the, I'm not talking about right now using like neoantigen vaccines in the adjuvant setting, although that is an incredibly interesting and exciting topic. That's prevention of recurrence. It's not primary prevention. So when you use, uh, when you talk about primary prevention, it is a different setting. And then, you know, people are interested in checkpoint inhibitors, but having used like pembrolizumab in like early stage patients for neoadjuvant, women have a lot of baseline autoimmune disease that comes roaring out the minute you give checkpoint and which is different than when we were giving in the metastatic setting. I think it's been, it's been instructive to see how many people we have their thyroids and their pituitaries and everything else. It's, it, it they're not non-toxic. Um, and, you know, new antigens, at least in BRCA one and two are not really shared across these tumor types. Okay. Um, which again, would be a, would have been nice if they were, um, now there are other things like the role of, and I can't pronounce it, like canakinumab, which is the IL-1 um, beta inhibitor, which was tested in cardiovascular disease. And they showed that there was like a decrease in lung cancer. You have to be really careful with those like secondary, you know, outcome measures, but there's an ongoing study for lung cancer and we'll, you know, we'll see. Uh, but, you know, those are just some of the, some of the, the, the comments. So instead, I'm going to really kind of talk about cancer vaccines. And again, this was profiled in science last year, this idea that you could, you know, vaccinate, you know, healthy people. And there are these existing immunointerception trials. Again, some are adjuvant, like the um, alpha lactalbumin trial at Cleveland Clinic. Uh, but you've got things like Olia Finn's MUC1 study for individuals with advanced colon polyps, um, which is like fascinating. You've got sort of mutant KRAS, which we've done sort of in dendritic cell fashion, but Liz Jaffe is doing as um, a peptide-based uh, KRAS study in high-risk individuals at Hopkins. Um, you've got Lynch syndrome, where there's shared neoantigens, although it hasn't been clear to me that they're HLA-specific, so I'm not exactly sure, but I think they're, they're putting in so many neoantigens that um, that, that um, may be useful. And then I'm going to talk to you about our study, which is... Um, uh, uh, using TERT as sort of the primary uh, uh, neoantigen. Uh, antigen. So TERT is the catal you know, a catalytic subunit of telomerase. It's immunogenic and it's uh, expressed in nearly all human cancers, about 95%, but it's restricted. Um, uh, it has a restricted expression in normal cells. And even more importantly, it appears in cancer cells that it's apparently processed and presented in the MHC groove. So it does actually like serve as sort of a, a target. 
It has a critical functional role in oncogenesis, which potentially limits mutation and deletion as a, a means of immune escape, um, because once it doesn't have telomerase, it can't be cancer anymore. And um, it's always funny because I'm like, a tiny portion of me has apparently always been an immunologist because back in 2007, we uh, uh, we published a study looking at HTERC peptides in metastatic breast cancer. And again, there was a robust immune response without toxicity. And an immune response did correlate with overall survival. But again, you use peptides, it has to be HLA specific, et cetera, et cetera. And peptides were just probably not really the thing. Um, so this has led to um, it studies using uh, TERT DNA. So this is plasma DNA. This is uh, Penn technology that was licensed to a company called Inovia. And this initial study, which I was not involved in, looked at 93 patients enrolled mostly at Penn, but at some other sites in the U.S., high-risk uh, early stage cancers, uh, breast, ovarian, and pancreatic made up most of these. They get uh, this TERT DNA plus or minus IL-12 DNA, and it's done using electroporation, which is this device here, which looks weird, but it isn't as bad as it looks. So because I've given now, I, I don't know, uh, 50 of these vaccines, and those little needles are kind of like acupuncture needles. So people don't mind that. So that goes in, they get then the like a flu shot. It feels like getting a flu shot. But then we press a button and there's three pulses of electroporation, which is a nice way of saying an electrical shock. And the reason for that is so that DNA plasmid is sort of taken up adequately by the cells. And people come back. So it's, you know, again, there's uh, the major adverse uh, reactions were injection site reactions, but really we saw no other um problems. And this, these are fresh LE spots. So they're just straight out of the blood. Uh, we see an immune response and in the patients with pancreatic cancer. And again, very careful to not make too much of this, but of these 34 patients who had resected pancreatic cancer, who were vaccinated, the Kaplan Myers on the right. And if you will, they did better than expected. Again, careful not to, to, to make too much of that. But that led us to believe that we had enough safety data to now take it into BRC carriers and specifically to say to the FDA, Hey, can we vaccinate healthy people? And they said, yes. Um, and they said, yes, right, as the pandemic hit. So then we put that on hold for a while. Uh, but this is now a slight um, uh, a tweak uh, to the vaccine just because the company had viled a DNA plasma with HTERT, WT1, and PSMA, which you know are all valid targets anyway. And again, alone in combination with uh, DNA plasma with IL-12 with electroporation. So we have two cohorts, the first cohort, our prior uh, BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers who had had prior cancer, we treated all 16 patients, eight had IL-12, eight did not. That was completed. We've enrolled our first three patients and we've treated our first healthy patient now. So we are now treating healthy BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers to look for immune response um, and safety. Um, so when I had to, I had a quick call uh, uh, about uh, the second patient who's coming on uh, today, um, because of course, when you leave, people have questions, but that's, but that's okay. So it's very exciting um, that we're, you know, uh, moving forward and we're going to see uh, where we go. So again, maybe we give a vaccine, then we give rank ligand, then we give a PARP inhibitor. I don't know uh, any other ideas that you might have, but I do think that biologically we are really kind of getting there. So you know, we've considered these concepts of cancer interception for years, but it really does feel like we have these tools to, to translate it. And we do have strategies that we are now currently testing. Um, now, large scale interception studies are extremely difficult, even in high risk cohorts where you know the, uh, you know, that, that uh, the denosumab trial has 2,900 people, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. And clearly you should do it in a high risk population, not sort of the general population, right? Because at least we can, we know what the risks are in terms of calculated risks. BRCA carriers are at risk for, for multiple cancers. So, you know, the idea here too, is that if you developed a successful interception strategy, it could be generalized. I mean, we're talking about breast, ovarian, pancreas, prostate. I mean, there's a lot of, if you have the right uh, way to intercept. The biology of the pre-malignant state is obviously really uh, uh, critical here. And so we're trying to uh, capture as much um, uh, you know, tissue banking as we can um, so that we can really look at our BRCA carriers, including um, preventative mastectomy specimens you know, that are we're collecting in, to allow for single cell sequencing and the like, um, because until we really understand that, that early stages, 
we're a little bit guessing on our interception strategies. Um, so um, we are very interested in collaboration and, and concepts. So I work with a lot of people at Penn um, uh, at the Baxter Center, and uh, many of them are listed here. We have a very large research team, giant counselors, and I have many colleagues that I've been fortunate to work uh, with uh, through my time. Um, but with that, um, I will stop and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Susan, for a wonderful seminar. Questions for Dr. Dalton? Sure. Yes. Yeah, wonderful talk. I was just wondering if you could educate us a little bit on how you think about the mechanism. How much of the heart effect is tumor intrinsic versus acting as an immunostimulant? Or how do you think about that? Yeah, I, so it's interesting. Um, I, I talked to a few people about this today because the you know when we look in the in in tumor tissues, right? So not so in actual people, um, we've even seen that in early stage cancers, the more HRD you have, the less immune, like they're less immunogenic, and like and vice versa. But when you look at the sort of preclinical models, clearly there's this interaction, right, of DNA damage response and uh, the immune response, right? So it, it just feels like there's like this funnel and like that, that, then there's immune evasion. And then when you have a human cancer, maybe it's different on the other side. Um, so I'm not sure. I mean, all I know is that when we did our, uh, both the Dervalumab elaborative trial and then the Evalumab talazoprib trial, we didn't really see any kind of enhancement of the immune response that doesn't directly answer your question, but one might have thought that we would have seen, you know, uh, uh, a better effect um, when we combine the two. Uh, so right now, you know, I think it's mostly, um, you know, PARP direct effect, but, you know, easily could be wrong. Awesome. Great. Uh, mechanistically, so there's all these different, there's trappers and yes. trappers. Yep. Is, is this, um, has the translational you know, preclinical stuff held up or has it been sort of mix and match? How has that worked out? Yeah, I think that the major, you know, the major things were, you know, aniparib wasn't a PARP inhibitor. So we got rid of that one pretty quickly. And then beliparib, which is the only one, you know, that uh, it's not, has not been FDA approved, doesn't have trapping. Uh, that was, that was um, really the only one you could reliably uh, combined with chemotherapy. And so, by the way, that might have a different benefit, right? Um, especially for the non brca mutated, like if you can combine it, um, uh, could be really interesting. The others, you know, obviously haven't been compared head to head. Um, I've used them all. Um, they, you know, you just tend to, the most potent ones, you tend to dose reduce more. So, so it's, it feels clinically like they, I'm not sure how much it matters. Um, but they definitely have different side effect profiles. And so, uh, and including some weird ones, like, you know, um, several of them, you can get a bump in the creatinine, which is not actually kidney damage. It's actually prevention of secretion of creatinine. So it's, you know, so they just have these little quirks to them. It's nice to have several of them, but I don't have a, I don't, because in breast cancer, I've mostly used a laparib. That's the one I tend to use. It has a little less model of suppression than telzoprib and telzoprib sometimes you can get hair thinning, but they're both good drugs. So if somebody doesn't, you know, do well with one, it's nice to have another one um, to go to. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so clinically, I don't think we've, we've really um, uh, noticed a big difference. Yeah. And the economics, none of them are generic. So none of them are generic. A lab will go first just because it was the first one to get approved, but, um, but they're, uh, uh, AstraZeneca is working on their part one selective. Now, what that will look like, um, you know, the data are, are limited so far, whether or not that's truly going to be uh, better. You know, I mean, people can ask the very reasonable question too, if, whether PARP inhibitors are just less toxic and more expensive platinums, you know, so, uh, I mean, I, clearly the mechanism is different, but um, if, you know, and there, there, there are certainly the, the re resistance mechanisms, there's a lot of similarities, but not complete. Um, and so I think that's like a whole nother area that we really need to better understand, which is better understanding the pie graph, the pie chart of the resistance mechanisms and understanding, depending on which resistance mechanism, what you might do next. Um, although reversion mutations are clearly important, probably they're only 20%. Um, I don't think there are more than that. I mean, at least that's the studies, you know, so far that we know of, which leaves like a lot of the pie chart not filled in. So reversion, when you see a reversion, you know, I 
they're going to be resistant to both, but these other mechanisms, it's not not as clear. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to ask questions from a basic science point of view about Rat fifty one as biomarker. Yeah, it's great in the lab. What is the challenge? What is the big challenge of it in the clinical setting? Just on, uh, particularly on like uh, you know slides, uh, the way that they they again, I'm gonna uh, kind of speak silly here, but you're looking at these little dots and you're looking at like the, the size of the dots and just in terms of the reproducible ability of it, it's just a little twitchy. So the, the, the group, you know, again, Violet Tessera and Judith Balmania, they've published this really beautiful work, but no one has commercialized that assay in a way that our pathologists feel like our pathologists tried. They're like, this is too twitchy. Like they need to be able to take a kit off the shelf and use it and score it. And they feel that it's hard to do that. Uh, again, that may not be a you know great answer. Yes, yes, on a on a slide, you know, on a you know, and again, it may be also that you're working off of you know a paraffin block and a and a slide that it makes it a little bit harder to do uh, as opposed to fresh tissue, which you know that is a little easier from my understanding. But it's really the fact that what we have are slides, and we need to be able to quantify it on slides. It's been a little bit challenging, so. I mean, I, I hope that it'll be nice if that's where, you know, where, what we get. Yeah. I love the idea of the interception and the, and the, the uh, vaccine trials that you run. Yeah. I wonder if you might need some further stimulation of the immune system to activate that immune response once you've primed it. So I wonder if there are any anecdotes of patients you've immunized who then get a cancer later and then get a checkpoint <laughs> and have some just incredible anecdotal response. Yeah, I'll have to ask, you know, if in that initial trial, you know, they there was seen, we haven't had, you know, knock wood in our initial 16 person cohort, we haven't had people have their, you know, any tumor recurrences yet. It's a really, it's a really interesting idea. Um, obviously the IL-12 is intended to like help out, but again, that's, that's like, that's a prime, not a boost. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, yes. So, uh, what do you think that the role of this in electric cooperation, um, you know, biologically, what, what do you want to achieve? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, you know, again, now, now this is where my non-immunology self will sound silly, but uh, my understanding and the way I explain it to patients <laughs> is that if the DNA is just sort of like the plasma is just sitting there and it's not taken up into the dendritic cells or antigen presenting cells, it's not going to be then presented in the groove. And so the electroporation helps actually um, you know, change the charge and get more of it actually into, into cells themselves rather than just kind of sitting in the interstitial space. Just so, like in the lab. Yeah. Well, normally uh, it's built for, let's say, kill the cell, right? Break the cell and then disrupt the membrane. Do, you know, disrupt the membrane. Yeah. Yeah, it's just the same basic thing. So, I mean, some some groups have used like uh, intradermal injections, like uh, noradesis. Her her two new vaccine is plasma based, and she's doing it intradermally. Intradermal injections are just actually like more twitchy. If you've ever, you know, just doing like um, anytime you do like a TB test or something like that, it's actually hard to get it just right intradermally. So, yeah, well. I, I, everybody, um, everybody's coming back. I mean, it, yes, it's, uh, it feels like you get punched in the arms three times, uh, but, uh, and uh, definitely, you know, contracts the muscle. So uh, definitely takes people off guard to like, what was that? But then it's over as soon as it's, you know, we do, do, do warn them extensively about it, but um, obviously switching over to mRNA technology would be nice. Um, we do have an mRNA Institute. Uh, and so that's certainly kind of part of the agenda, but making sure first that everything is safe and immunogenic, you know, that's the first, first step. Um, yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Yep. Is there any other other related to the things that we were talking Yes. Yeah. No, I mean, there's like, there's lots of sort of drugs sort of out there. So, you know, we have a trial looking at pull data inhibitors, um, both like, but again, that's probably going to be in combination with PARP inhibitors. Um, it's being tested, you know, the, these early stage trials, you know, you do it alone in combination, et cetera. 
So there's there's a lot of combination drugs, you know, BAT plus PARP, ATR plus PARP, um, pull theta plus PARP. I used to have a slide that was like, you know, the word hippopotamus and like how many ways you could integrate hippopotamus, um, you know, that factorial design. If you go and you look at PARP inhibitors plus something else on clinicaltrials.gov, you can pretty much find almost everything. Um, but yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of interest in other drugs that would create a, a synthetic lethality effect that are, you know, beyond PARP. Um, but from a clinical trial design space, here's the deal. You have a PARP inhibitor, they work. So if you wait till a tumor progresses on a PARP inhibitor, and then you give it your experimental drug, if it didn't work, that just may be because that whole pathway is resistant, right? So how do you get a drug, you know, how do you give a patient a drug that may not be as good, right? It's just, it's just a, it's always an interesting clinical trial design question. So you have to have some evidence that your drug might be better um, before you can, you know, take, take away the standard of care, right? So it is just always is an interesting conundrum of how you move these drugs up. Do you have to worry about alt in these in these vaccine trials, or is that not an issue? In yeah, I mean, it's always an interesting uh, point. In in the data, in uh, again, way back now. Now I'm going to pretend to be a molecular biologist, but uh, back in sort of the day, you know, when you when you looked at uh, tumors that were that had you know overexpression of telomerase, if you abrogated that, they did not then move to alt. Does that make sense? Like they, they, they died. They didn't transfer over to alt. And so in the trials that we did, both the gender Excel, the peptide trials and the subsequent studies, we haven't seen that in cancers that have, you know, recurred. Um, it seems to be sort of like not, you know, once it's on the telomerase path, it doesn't move over. But again, Steve, you, you I mean, you know, yes. Yes. Yeah. These tumor types will generally have all right? correct, so like, yeah, uh, sarcomas, correct, and tumors, uh, which aren't you know, typically like, seen in, in BRCA related tumors. So it's, it's not something we, but but of course we're we uh, have permission from patients, like if they have any kind of biopsies or any kind of preventative surgeries, that we can um, take a piece and look. So, all right, thank you very much. Thank you so much Thanks. Yep.